On Wednesday the 20th of May 2020, Dr. Hugh Turpin of Queen's University in Belfast gave an online seminar to members of the Humanist Association of Ireland on the nature of secularism and the modern rejection of Catholicism in modern Ireland. This seminar was originally intended to be delivered as one of the Humanist Association's regular Sunday meetings. However, as a result of the COVID-19 lockdown, we decided to try a fully online format for the first time. We were delighted with the response. Well over 100 members tuned in for it. We're pleased to now make the video of this seminar available. The presentation part was followed by half an hour of Q&A and discussion among attendees, but this part has not been included. A few words on our speaker first. Dr. Hugh Turpin is a lecturer at Queen's University Belfast. He holds a BA in philosophy from Trinity College, master's degrees in social anthropology from Oxford University and cognitive science from University College Dublin. And he has a joint PhD from Queen's University Belfast and Aarhus University in Denmark in the cognitive anthropology of religion. All that, of course, means that he's a very, very bright guy. His research interests include a lot of the stuff that humanists would find exciting. Things like the decline of religious systems and beliefs, secularization theory, the anthropologies of Christianity and Catholicism, and the anthropology and psychology of morality. His PhD research examines the growing rejection of Catholicism in the Republic of Ireland from a cognitive and social anthropological perspective. Sincere thanks to Dr. Turpin for taking the time to speak to us about his research findings, which will form the subject matter for a forthcoming book, which you should really keep an eye out for. And now, over to the seminar. Um. Okay, so as Eamon mentioned, I'm going to be kind of following on the coattails of John Lanman, who spoke a little while ago, and applying some of his ideas and some of my own um, to the situation of secularization in Ireland. I mean, Ireland's often kind of held up in recent media as uh, a, an incredibly quick and surprising case of of the decline of religious influence and not just religious influence but um um sort of religious morality and 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 religious belief so um this seemed to be a curious thing to me and for that reason it was basically what i pursued my phd research on so i'm going to show you some of the data that i extracted from my my phd research and um, advance some sort of tentative interpretations of what that data might, might mean. And I'm, I'm more than open to hearing your own takes as well on, on, on what you think some of these numbers and interpretations are. I mean, I'd be very, very happy to, to take questions afterwards and to, to um, explore the topic that way. Now, uh, the title, Unholy Catholic Ireland, um, I don't mean this title to be kind of, um, you know, in some way kind of critical or, or, or unpleasant towards Ireland. Ireland. I, I kind of chose it for, for, for two reasons. I mean, I suppose there's a kind of pun intended in it. These are the people within Catholic Ireland. Um, who, who would themselves be considered unholy. And at the same time, it is the very unholiness, the kind of moral turpitude of the Catholic past that creates a kind of shared identity among people that might not necessarily have that much in common in the first place. Um, that kind of caused me to, to, to choose this title to begin with. So um, if I was to basically go through just in, in terms of an introduction to, to tell you what we'll be talking about today. Um, first, I, I kind of want to focus on this new and growing moral stance in Irish society that's defined by, by the rejection of Catholicism. Um, and the, the research itself was really mixed methods research. So I interviewed about 45 people. Now those people really varied in range from members of dedicated secularist groups like Atheist Ireland to priests, but perhaps more interestingly, just to the broad swathe of people that exist in between those two groups, you know, to the, the kind of average man in the pub 
what what do they think of Catholicism? What do they think? And how do they justify their involvement with a religion that seems increasingly to be sort of almost morally tainted? And um, because my interviews could only ever be snowballing, you know, I was based in Dublin. I did try to 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 um, base myself in Ferns as a field site, but the church chased me out of there. So I basically just had to had to take what I could get and base myself in Dublin instead. Because of the limit of those interviews, I also conducted a survey which was nationally representative for a number of, of, of variables, but was obviously, as you can see on your screens now, limited. There were only 250 people involved in the survey, so it has to be taken with a pinch of salt. And on top of that, um, I did ethnographic fieldwork, you know, what, what John and other anthropologists refer to as a deep hanging out, just kind of being there in various places, watching what goes on, um, not just offline in the real world, but also online, because um, in any kind of contemporary society, the internet is an incredibly rich resource uh, of what people think and how they construct arguments, how they construct moral positions, how they 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 sort of build these positions in opposition to their antagonists and these kind of things. So I, I really looked at the, the online and the offline world together. And I focused on, 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 on secularist and religious and what you might call culturally Catholic people, because I wanted to see how they kind of sparked off one another and how their kind of positions and almost justifications for, for, for their relationship to religion uh, were related to one another because in terms of my background I, I, I'm very influenced by the anthropology of morality which I suppose at its core looks at how people attempt to construct themselves as good moral individuals, how they attempt to maintain face and that was something of profound interest to me particularly in a situation where you have um a religious tradition that is tarnished um but at the same time the kind of stigmas and 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 kind of negative associations that swirl around not being religious simultaneously existing with that so hopefully hopefully all of this is going to result in a book so um i have a advanced contract with Stanford to publish it. Um, and the initial draft of the book is due uh, at the end of July, uh, three days after my firstborn son is due to be born. So it's uh, kind of like a, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a rather fraught, um, time but I, I'm, I'm working hard on it and hopefully they will both be born uh, healthy and in good condition at the end of July. So today I'm going to show some initial findings uh, mostly from the statistical side of what I did and um, after that I kind of want to delve more into the qualitative and ask what what this might mean. Um, and I, perhaps foolishly, um, I also want to think briefly about the future, about the future of religion in Ireland. Um, you know, prediction is a mug's game, but I think it's something we, we, we can't help but involve ourselves in. So just to kind of give you a bit of a background, as we all know here in this group, I would say devout Catholicism is in decline. So once upon a time, Ireland was considered Western European kind of secularization outlier. All the other countries post-war, post-World War II of, of, of Western Europe were secularizing rapidly. Um, 
Ireland as this kind of isolated island of faith seemed to maintain this deferent and conservative religious culture that was not present in other societies to the same degree, at least not in Western Europe. I mean, here we have an image from 1979 of uh, Pope John Paul II's um, gathering in, in, in the Phoenix Park. There was one and a quarter million people attended that. I mean, it's an extraordinary number of people. And if you've, if you've kind of read any of David McWilliams' work, you'll know that this huge congregation of people wasn't necessarily an indication of massive devout religious faith. Um, as, as McWilliams talks about, there were a lot of people, um, to be honest, copulating in the, the, the you know, tents and the tent ground that were, that were set up around the, the event. And there were a lot of young John Paul II's born in the year to follow. But um, it was certainly a kind of powerful indicator of the strength of the church at a point in time where, 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 where it was seen to be waning in other Western European societies. So if we kind of fast forward to 2019, um, we find that a large majority of people still identify as Catholic. I think in the last census, it was 78.3% put themselves down as Catholic. Um, but at the same time, practice is in rapid decline. Um, something like below 30% would attend mass on a weekly basis. Whereas in 1979 or even 1989, I think that was up in the high 80s, even maybe the 90s. And at the same time, you know, abortion, same-sex marriage, blasphemy, all these things have, legal, have, have been legalized by popular referenda. So the kind of default that we get, and this is something I want to push back against and argue against to a degree, the kind of default picture we get from sociologists is that the new default in Ireland is what they call liberalized cultural Catholicism. That is, people go on identifying as Catholic they, they kind of cling to Catholicism as, as, a, as a means of maintaining a link to the past and to traditions. And, um, and this is basically what is going to be the status quo going forward. It may be, it may not be. I think there are reasons to question it. And I think there are things that are left out and not observed in this particular kind of picture of, of kind of post-devout Ireland that we have. Uh, just to finish this slide off, here's Pope Francis in 2018. As you can see, there were 130,000 people that turned out to, to, to see the Pope at that point in time. I mean, I know that there was certain consternation in the newspapers about nope to the Pope, about this kind of social movement that was going to buy up tickets and prevent devout Catholics from getting to see their idol. I mean, what this picture demonstrates is, is, is really how unnecessary Nope to the Pope even was. Um, I was there myself at Pope Francis's uh, audience. And what struck me more than anything was the huge, vast tracts of space as he shuttled about the place in his Pope cart, almost like kind of Pac-Man shooting down aisles in a maze, waving. And it was really, really, the, it, was, it, it was quite an underwhelming affair, you know? Um, on the way there, there were, there were, there were kind of um, merchandise touts with, bunches of yellow Vatican flags going, ah, oh, for fuck's sake, you know, fuck this, shoving them in the bin because they weren't going to be able to sell them. So it was really quite a kind of extreme, uh, visceral indication of how far interest in the church had fallen. So whatever about nope to the Pope, in 2018, we kind of had meh to the Pope. That was sort of the, um, the, 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 the reaction that Francis got to an extent.
So the current kind of consensus sociologically is that we've seen a kind of laissez-faire, disinterested cultural Catholicism consolidated over the past it's a few last few decades. And of course, there are different interpretations of what this exactly means. So, I mean, you could take a kind of a pious variant or an ethnic variant. So, for example, here's Mary McAleese now, I think really the spokesperson of the more pious variant of what it means to be a contemporary, nominally Irish Catholic. Um, as the sociologists of Fagan and O'Connell say, high levels of belief and identification as a religious person, coupled with decreases in attendance and confidence in the Catholic Church, indicate that for Catholics in Ireland, religion is becoming private and personal. So here you have the idea that draws on a particular kind of strand, and often a very religiously motivated strand of the sociology of religion, that people have an inherent deep meaning for transcendent kind of transcendent meaning uh, for a transcendent sense of the divine. And even though Ireland is no longer kind of inst institutionalized in its Catholicism, people have this kind of personalized Catholicism, this sort of personalized belief in God. They might feel betrayed by the church, but they haven't quite rejected the teachings of Jesus Christ, that kind of thing. So that's the kind of pious variant of cultural Catholicism. And on the other side, you get the kind of ethnic variant. So I think David McWilliams is a good kind of example of this. Now here's a quote from his recent book. Um, Here the locals have been baptizing and confirming their children for years without believing a word of it. Being a pro-communion repealer sits easy here. It's an ambivalent place. Here's the idea that people will kind of go through religious rituals for their social functions more than anything. And, and the, the idea that, that there's some kind of belief in, in some sort of transcendent beyond is just out of the picture. It's just not something people are really interested in. And, you know, of course, both positions exist in Irish society. I'd be a fool to say that one is true and the other is wrong. But what I will say is that they, they, they both leave something out. And what they leave out really is the emergence of, of, of kind of opposition to Catholicism, opposition to being Catholic as something that is just kind of default and something that, that, that one has no choice over within Irish society. So here are three books I think that, that, that really um, bring this home to a certain degree. One is Republic of Shame by Keelan Hogan, which is a kind of fantastic look at the, at the, at the dark side of the, the, the kind of religious culture of the past, of the shaming and abuse and incarceration of women, the, the, the kind of um, issues to do with forced, forced adoption of children. Um, we have coercive confinement in Ireland, the idea that the, the kind of De Valera's Ireland was also an Ireland in which huge numbers of people were, were incarcerated for, for, for not adhering to the status quo. And um, recently another book that's come out is Love's Betrayal by Peter Mulholland. And Mulholland talks about how long before the sex abuse scandals kind of emerged, there was, there was a kind of growing, burgeoning sense of discontent about the hubris and power that the religious had within Ireland, especially um, the degree to which people from working class backgrounds were, were abused within education systems and that kind of thing. So, so underneath this kind of harmonious, happy picture of, of kind of devout obeisance, gradually segueing towards, towards a kind of more liberated, but still comfortable cultural Catholic default, there's a lot of darkness. And this, gets, this is getting more and more uncovered and more and more discussed in books like the ones that I've, I've, I've just put up on the screen here. So that takes me to the fact that one thing that is utterly overlooked in um, 
contemporary sociological accounts is the rise of non-religion in Ireland, rise of people who don't want to affiliate with any kind of religious institution at all. And I put the word unbelief in here as well. It's not a word I'm completely comfortable or happy with, but it's there. So I'm not gonna go on and defend it right now. But just to give you some kind of um, statistics on that, um, levels of non-religious identity were, they really were negligible right up to the mid nineties. And the mid nineties is the point at which you start to see um, clerical abuse scandals starting to really burgeon and emerge. And also Father Ted, that could have something to do with it as well. I'm currently mired in thoughts about whether Father Ted was, was a um, good or bad thing for the fortunes of the church. Um, so if we look at statistics in 2018, 10% um, in the census uh, identified as not having a religion. And in the Euro European Social Survey, that was far higher. That was 26% identified as not having a religion. And there are differences between the questions that are asked in these two bodies of, of, of surveying that, that can kind of explain that. I mean, in particular, the census tends to amplify um, what, what, what we call natal nominalism. If somebody got baptized as something, they put themselves down as it, even if they really don't like the, the ideology or the worldview or, or, or whatever that goes along with it. It's just kind of, oh, well, yeah, yeah, it happened to me. I got baptized, so I know what box to tick. So the ESS may in some ways give a kind of more accurate depiction of dissatisfaction with the idea of being Catholic than the census does. But even the ESS is limited because um, the ESS gives people the option of various religious denominations, but doesn't really give them the option of sort of worldviews that are not tied to a religion. So still in its subtle way, it kind of pushes people towards denominational affiliation. So another survey tells us, I think as Eamon mentioned at the beginning, that atheism seems to be growing faster than anywhere here in Ireland, barring Vietnam, that we have the eighth highest percentage of convinced atheists at 10% in the world, and that this outstrips UK, Germany, and the Scandinavian countries. So this is um, according to Win Gallup data from 2013. Um, another paper uh, by Riberick, a Dutch sociologist, it, it, it tends to find that Ireland has the smallest non-religious minority, but that the non-religious minority in Ireland are the most anti-religious in Western Europe. So, uh, and, and if we take that into account with the fact that they're also the fastest growing, we have a kind of large bulk of the Irish people that are sort of not described in contemporary sociological literature, not looked at. And I think they're a very significant group. Um, and I suppose when I set out to do my PhD, um, I wanted to look at what factors kind of, what causal factors underlay this change and what descriptive factors made perhaps Irish non-religious people distinctive and different in some way to their peers elsewhere in Europe. And I know when I say Irish non-religious people, that's a grossly broad, homogenizing kind of statement. I mean, there are, there is many different kinds of non-religious people as, 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 as there are non-religious individuals, but still I wanted to try and try and pick out some factors that I thought were distinctive about the Irish situation. So 
beginning quite early, one thing I kind of realized was there was a strong moral component to being non-religious in Ireland. Um, if you look at Denmark or, or the other Scandinavian countries, the Czech Republic, uh, a number of other Western, Eastern and Central European countries, uh, Estonia, interestingly, you'll find that, you know, people who are not religious, they don't really care about not being religious. It just doesn't really matter to them. In Ireland, that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be more kind of fiery. There's an undertone of, 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 of rejection to it. And I think there are a lot of reasons why that should be the case. But there are four kind of, I suppose, key factors that I myself, and by, these by no means exhaust the different factors that are involved, but these are the ones I focused on. So there are kind of four key factors that I thought were, 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 were key to the emergence of this new moral stance, which is in a way, a new way of being a good Irish person. If in the past, you know, if in the 60s and the 50s, being a good Irish person was being a good Irish Catholic, now there's a new model of what it is to be a good Irish person. And what are the factors that have kind of brought about the emergence of this new model, what it is to be a good moral Irish person in a society that was once to be honest, near theocratic. And here, here are the ones that leapt out at me. Uh, one was the fading of religious socialization itself. So where once we had a society that was saturated in behavioral evidence that all the people around you believed, we really don't have that anymore. The second is church scandals. So, I mean, there has been no deficit of religious scandals and of course you know the, the the kind of catholic scandals that we're so familiar with child abuse so on they're they're global phenomenon you know poland has them the states in its pennsylvania report has them everywhere has them and yet they seem to do more work in ireland than they seem to do in other places and in part that is probably relating to the, the deep intertwinement of church and state in Ireland and, and the fact that we had alongside clerical abuse, a whole range of other kind of oppressive institutions like Magdalen laundries and, and mother and baby homes. But they're also put to work in a way that is, is, is different um, to what we find in other societies. And I think that relates to this next factor, institutionalized Catholicism. I mean, if you thought just up to recently abortion was illegal, uh, the education system is still overwhelmingly um, religious in orientation, even though that varies by school to school. You know, some schools who claim to have a Catholic ethos really will attempt to indoctrinate their pupils. Um, other schools, my own included, um, basically during religious class, showed us videos of the Simpsons and then told us after 45 minutes, any questions? Okay, lads, time to go and do a real subject. So, I mean, there's a huge degree of variation in what that meant, but institutionalized Catholicism is, an, is, is, is a very important point I think in the emergence of, of ex-Catholicism as a strong kind of sense of opposition towards religious orthodoxy. And the last one, and I think one that's often overlooked, is cultural Catholicism. It's the kind of habitual, laissez-faire, low-cost link to past Catholic tradition that many people who have who have kind of struck out against Catholicism feel retains the influence and power of the church in Ireland, even though, even though the people that are doing the retaining don't really care that much about religion and don't really care that much 
about, about, about the church. So I think it's a kind of a mixture of these four factors help to explain why in Ireland, out of the Western European countries, we get this particularly strong, albeit not that widely dispersed, stance of antagonism towards religion. So I'm going to look at some data now that um, kind of hopefully will shed some light on some of this. So just to begin with, um, with this issue of fading socialization, um, just to step back and look at it from a kind of theoretical perspective, I want to take a, co a cognitive anthropological view on what religion is and how it transmits. So the kind of basic default model in this area of, of, of study called the cognitive anthropology of religion assumes that religious ideas are kind of notions or concepts that, that somehow latch on to the human mind and, and, and spread from mind to mind almost in a viral kind of way. So, for example, the idea that there is agency in in, in the world around us, even when we can't perceive it. Uh, here you see a woman biting her computer as its computer was somehow to blame for the fact that it, that it, that it you know, didn't do what it was she wanted it to do. Um, this idea that somehow kind of, kind of strange ideas, perhaps of disembodied presences, latch themselves on as somehow being salient, noteworthy, in human cognition. This sort of, perhaps the idea that he, he's just shaking the sand out of his shorts. I'm not showing you pornography here, I promise. But th that, that kind of, this idea that, that, that there's something about being watched, that perhaps we've evolved some sort of disposition to feel that we're being watched all the time because it helps us to control our behavior and helps us to prevent us from doing things that might lead us to be kind of, you know, might, might lead us to do reckless things that would, that would then incur the punishment of our fellows. So, so the original cognitive science of religion kind of drew on all these kind of ideas about innate biases in the human mind that might make particular kind of ideas like we find in religion sort of catchy and prominent. And, and, and give them a tendency to transmit from mind to mind. But this all had a problem. And that was the world is full of these kind of ideas. It's full of these kind of ideas. Why would some catch and others wouldn't? So then there was kind of a, kind of a development where people started looking more at, at um, social factors. So if you take these kind of catchy factors and if you add behavior to the mix, you know, kind of social proof, um, what's sometimes described as credibility enhancing displays. So John Landman, who you may have heard from previously, um, has talked a great deal about this. If you take these kind of ideas and then you take human behavior, that seems to indicate that the people around you really, really take these kind of ideas seriously. Here we see a kind of um, um, Catholic parade in a small Irish village. Here we see some sort of um, evangelical snake handlers really, really kind of emotively demonstrating the fact that these aren't just concepts. These are things they take deadly seriously and they're indexed in their behavior. That when we get these two things coming together, we get the transmission of religious ideas. Uh, and, and, and I mean, there are any number of of examples you could take from Ireland, looking around, um, that would constitute good creds as they're acronymized. Uh, you know, fields full of people staring into the sun, hoping to see the Virgin Mary, celibate priests, you know, people that have renounced sexual intercourse, such as the degree of their, well, you know, that say they've renounced sexual intercourse such as the degree of their conviction that this is something 
real and true. So, so religion, because it can't be seen, benefits immensely from social proof that it's true. And the more social proof there exists, the more it is that people, and they use the kind of, the kind of jargon, cultural learners, and by that they mean children. That by that they mean young people growing up in an environment where this behavior is kind of present all around them the more these ideas kind of catch on. So if we move from that, from that idea of how religion kind of latches on through extreme behavioral demonstrations of commitment to the faith. And if we look at um, Irish Catholicism today, it kind of draws this notion of low cost, cultural Catholicism as a kind of ongoing default into a sort of a, in, into a sort of a state of question. I mean, let's have a look at this, for example. Uh, this is a headline I, I, I got from The Independent just recently, the other day. Um, and, and of all the terrible things that um, COVID-19 implies for, for, for mankind, Perhaps one of the most horrifying is that a generation may never make their confirmation. And you can see that the sub headline below this is that there's extra onus on parents to arrange the sacraments now, you know, extra onus. So what you see in Ireland to a degree is that being Catholic, being religious is more and more a kind of matter of outsourcing it's sort of, it's sort of a, a thing that, that, that's pushed onto the schools and parents kind of step back and allow the schools to, 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 to I don't know, do faith formation or, or, or prepare kids for communion, which is also not really very much of a credibility enhancing display because it's actually a fairly pleasurable, profitable, um, sort of institution. I've heard talk of kids making a thousand euro just from doing their confirmation. So, so the sort of idea that that Irish people are still engaging in the kinds of behaviours that will transmit to the people around them that they are that they are. Um, Can you guys hear me? Uh, yeah, there was a bit of a drop there, you but I okay. Didn't okay. Thanks. So the idea that you know be belief is still being transmitted through behaviour has really fallen away in Ireland. And and here, for example, is an interview with um, a guy called Peter, who I interviewed just a while ago. Now Peter is a, I mean, I wouldn't call him a humanist, but he married humanist. Um, however, he baptized his child, and I asked him why, and he said, you know, well, we're just like, you know, getting into schools is stressful, it's a hard thing, I mean, we're all fine now, but it's all very stressful, and you kind of want every advantage you can get, and um, I mean, you know, I'm a bit scientific slash businessy minded I thought if this gives me an edge, I'll take it, you know, and he'd also prepared a kind of spin story for the priest. And I had a whole spin story that I was going to give for that. Well, of well, we lost our faith, but we don't want our son to be so unlucky. And, you know, we want to raise him Catholic and blah, 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 blah. But it didn't come to that in the end. So there's kind of like a, a social capital motivation. And it's extremely obvious, I think, even, even to quite young children, that religion is a, is, is a social affair. It's not really something to do with people believe about 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 the world it's just kind of social rituals that are gone through for various reasons so we see that kind of collapse from devout catholicism into this kind of habitual catholicism that's one 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 stage on the decline um and if you look at kind of like um statistics on this so here we have a graph on the left 
So if you look at the bottom of this graph, you have 18 to 24. And if you look on the right, you have 65 plus. And on the, um, the x-axis there going up, you have basically a, a scale devised by John Lanman, which measures the degree to which people felt that their parents were motivated in their behavior by religion. And what we see is just a collapse as the generations pass. So um, each generation essentially perceives its parents to have been less influenced in their behavior by Catholicism than the generation before. Um, to put it in the mouths of a priest, there's no transmission of the doctrines of the faith, and people aren't actually working, worshipping, and they're not going to Mass. They're learning some sort of fairy tale stuff in class. There's no effect. So we see this kind of hollowing out of the sacred canopy, which is what Peter Berger called it, the secularization theorist, where, where religion, instead of being this kind of omnipresent sort of force, it's a bit of a social ritual, a bit of a superficial kind of one. And that's one, one, one kind of stage. And of course, beneath this, there are a whole of, load of reasons why this has happened to do with economic transformations and other things like that. But rather than bore into those, I want to move on to the next factor. So one thing people often kind of wonder about is the degree to which those who, who no longer identify as Catholic are still theistic. So um, I've got an asterisk here on ex-Catholicism to note the importance of how the question is asked. So in the census, for example, you know, they ask you, what is your religious affiliation, if any, and people tend to, 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 to tick Catholic. Um, I used a different kind of method in the survey that I did, whereby I, um, I first asked them, had they been baptized? And I then asked them, do they still consider themselves to be a Catholic or something else? And it produced completely different results. So um, basically out of a survey of 250 apparently randomly selected members of the Irish public, um, I got 96 Catholics. Now these were people that rejected neither church teachings nor a Catholic identity. Those are the two questions I asked. Do you reject church teachings? And how do you identify? And I gave them a list of, of various religious identifiers. Um, there were 59 privatized Catholics. These are people that rejected church teachings, but didn't reject a Catholic identity. And then there were uh, 81 people who rejected both church teachings and a Catholic identity. So it would seem that if you give people that opportunity to say first that they were um, baptized, uh, the need or the onus to go on and identify themselves as Catholics pretty much collapses. So of the ex-Catholics, um, approximately one third identified as atheist, um, one third identified as agnostic, and one third identified as spiritual but not religious. I didn't put humanist in as an option. I put in a box that allowed people to enter whatever it was they, 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 they felt best represented them. And I did get a few angry comments saying, you know, I'm really pissed off that humanism wasn't there. So um, if the person that was pissed off is currently in the audience, uh, I, I humbly apologize for not representing you in my PhD survey. Um, so if we look though at kind of, so yeah, the, the best kind of predictor of being in this ex-Catholic um, category was low exposure to parental religious socialization um, a liberal moral outlook and youth. And in the interviews, they tended to be humanistic, they tended to be progressive, they tended to have a high regard for science. Some of them, spirituality was important. They were very, very rarely religiously apathetic though. And if we look kind of more quantitatively at how they, how they, they um, rank themselves, 
as believers in various things. So let's have a look at this. This is a box and line plot. So if we look at the left, we have a Catholic belief scale. So this is a scale that basically asks them about the degree to which they believed in typically Catholic kind of religious representations, the virgin birth, um, you know, things like that. And if we look at the right, it was just certainty of God's existence or non-existence. And what we see here is that, that the ex-Catholics, they're, they're basically flatlining. They have no credence whatsoever in Catholic religious beliefs. Uh, when it comes to, to kind of sort of more vague, nebulous theism, there is a certain group, about a quarter of the data, that look like they're above the kind of agnostic position. But mostly, mostly we see a kind of skepticism about religious belief going on in that group too, even when it's in its more nebulous kind of form. Uh, the privatized Catholics are every bit as theistic as the, the devout Orthodox Catholics, but they're much less certain about specific Catholic beliefs. So it seems that this privatization is a way of kind of having your cake and eating it, of kind of maintaining a Catholic moniker, but, but, but not holding on to the kind of dogmatic orthodox beliefs. So after talking about kind of who is a Catholic and, and, and at a very crude level what they believe, I just want to look a bit more at this issue of moral contamination. So um, I basically asked the survey respondents whether the Catholic Church had been a good, bad or negative influence in Irish society. So on the left, we can see the Catholics, in the middle, the privatized Catholics, and the right, the ex-Catholics. And I think what leaps out of this graph, most of all for me, is the sheer level of consensus among ex-Catholics that the Catholic Church has been a bad influence on Irish society. You can see the bad column there takes up nearly all of the responses. Even the devout, even the devout Catholics on the left look sort of ambivalent and conflicted about the role the Catholic Church has had in Irish history. And another um, interesting piece of data I got was to do with trust. So uh, a lot of the time we're kind of, let's ex excuse me, extensive literature out there on the degree to which atheists are a particularly distrusted category of person. The idea behind this is that it, it's, it's basically that um, atheists don't fear God, that they can do whatever they want. They're kind of wild card and they can't be trusted um, morally in the same way that someone who has theistic faith can be trusted. Now, these are not my feelings or words, but these are the kind of attitudes that come up again and again in surveys, even within countries that are quite atheistic themselves. Um, it seems that theists are more trusted than atheists. Ireland seems to buck this trend a little bit. So if we have a look at this, excuse me, um, this shows us um, trust rankings, excuse me, among priests and bishops. So what I basically did was I gave the respondents 10 social categories, ranging from shopkeeper to school teacher to policeman to politician to atheist to criminal to banker and then asked them to rank these in order of how much they trust them so what we tend to see is with the catholics priests are trusted very highly the privatized it goes down and the ex-Catholics priests are trusted below most social, social categories, but above, um, above bankers and criminals, as I recall it, but below politicians. And bishops are trusted by the ex-Catholics uh, below politicians and bankers, but above criminals. So 
there's an extreme kind of distrust of clerical authority that's present in Irish society, in particular among those people who have kind of disaffiliated from, from the church. Now, the next thing I did was I did a free list. So to give you an example of what a free list is, it's a pretty basic cognitive anthropological technique that dates back to the, to the 60s, where you basically give people a term, let's say love, and you ask them to list everything that comes into their head as soon as it comes into their head. So you get a kind of swift idea of their intuitive gut reactions to a particular term. So um, in this case, the, the free list I, I, I gave people was Irish Catholic Church. So if we look at the, the, the group who continue to identify as Catholic, and Smith's S, by the way, sorry, Smith's S means how frequently words occurred across the lists and how close they tended to be to the top of the lists. And that gives you the computation Smith says. So here we have clergy, mass, sacraments, or rites of passage, communion, churches, Pope, God, abuse, pedophilia, Jesus, confession, these kind of things. Um, a more negative looking kind of list with the privatized Catholics. But when we get to the ex-Catholics, uh, paedophilia leaps right to the top. It's the first thing people think about when they think about the Irish Catholic Church. And beneath that, we have clergy, probably because they are linked to this mental association. Then ideas of corruption, of conservatism, of authoritarianism. We have mass in there for some reason. We have the education system, which obviously is a flashpoint in secular kind of secular religious tensions in Ireland. Um, so you get a much more kind of negative list and this negative list is not so much focused on stuff like like fiction or nonsense or made up stuff it's very very much focused on the moral the moral dimension of the catholic church so i, I now I, I can only make a correlational claim here i can't say that this that in some way ex-catholics were more sensitive to the moral transgressions of the church. But what I can say is that the rejection of Catholicism is definitely linked to uh, authoritarian moral conservatism and also to, to fundamentally immoral conduct. The idea that the church is morally contaminated and perpetrated in dreadful abuses. I'm just gonna get a, a glass of water and I'll be back in about 30 seconds. Okay, so to go on beyond that now, um, I kind of want to look more, more, more at a qualitative level at what lies behind this strong, dark image of Irish Catholicism. So I want to look at some sorry of the... To, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Hugh. Um, yeah. I'd imagine that uh, given that we've still got well over 100, 100 listeners, people are finding this fascinating, but... Do you want to leave a, a bit of time for questions? I already had um, you email through to me, uh, just checking how much longer you have left of the presentation. Okay. Um, how much longer should I try and wrap this up in? Um, <laughs> would, uh, would, would 10 minutes be too little? No, I'll do it in 10 minutes. Thanks for, thanks for letting me know, Eamon. Yeah. Okay. So um, just to look at some of these kind of own verbatim reaction to um, the, 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 the Irish Catholic Church. Here we have it here. So we can see in this left kind of like a, a moral appraisal of the church as a source of guilt and oppression. It has a negative effect on women's rights. Um, it treats women as virgins, mothers or whores. And this idea that it has a chokehold on the country, that it was able through this chokehold to physically, sexually, and psychologically abuse children, 
So we have this very much idea of the church as a source of damage and harm. And um, what we see is powerful kind of reactions against harm, unfairness, hypocrisy and oppression, all kind of building up into this strong moral position that it is the right thing to do to oppose Catholicism. And I mean, also at the same time, people kind of tend to assume that, that this is, this is sui generis, this is a, things flipping on their heads, that the Irish have always been really Catholic. But there is a certain degree at which, in which this fits in with a kind of a schema, with an idea of what it already is to be Irish. And what is it to be Irish? It is to be oppressed by outside external forces. And I think you can see this in this, this, this um, image on the right that was kind of projected across social media. We've been colonized by Vikings, Normans, and English, but the worst offenders of the Roman Catholic Church. They beat, raped, and killed our children, enslaved and silenced our women, and told us we'd all go to hell for questioning. So you, you, you have this kind of, on the one hand, this appeal to deep-seated moral intuitions about how it is wrong to harm people, about how unfairness and cheating and hypocrisy are deeply objectionable, and you have that linked to a kind of historically consonant idea of what it is to be Irish. And to be Irish is to, 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 to push back against unjust oppression. So you have quite a powerful kind of mental cocktail here. So then we also have um, the issue of inst institutional influence and scandal. So um, as we know, the church retains influence, especially in the education system till quite recently in abortion legislation. Um, here we have Dermot Martin inspecting a school classroom. Um, here we have a, 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 an example of a textbook where atheism is kind of a stigmatized position um, in the rest of the textbook, which claims to kind of show the variety of different beliefs. Uh, you, see, you see kind of people with bindis smiling, people with turbans smiling, but the atheist is this kind of individual screaming no. So you have this kind of Im embeddedness in the education system. At the same time, Catholic scandals are completely unresolved. So new issues come to light like tume, old issues fail to be, fail to be addressed, sort of compensation from religious orders and so on. Um, so I think what you get is a kind of mutual relationship where there are tensions around secularization and they activate scandal. But on the other hand, when a scandal bubbles to the surface, it activates tensions around secularization. And you can see then this, and this kind of weaponization, counter weaponization, that, 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 that sort of defines the Irish attitude towards um, religion. I mean, just for example, a, um, a cartoon disseminated on journal.ie with a priest condemning a, a, a repeal campaigner from atop a mound of skulls. Or you have David Quinn, who, as you know, is at the Iona Institute, going on about how church bashing is the new Brit bashing. It's kind of a, a, a sort of tense moral situation where the scandals that we know have happened get put to use to try and defend or break institutional entrenchment between church and state. So, and I think what this does is it means that religion can't be a kind of unconscious thing anymore, as it might be in the past, as it might have been in other societies and in other situations. They kind of draw this kind of unconscious ethno-Catholicism into awareness. And that's what allows it to be repudiate, repudiated in favor of this kind of ex-Catholic normative moral stance. They force it into, the, in, into a kind of a spotlight. Here we see some protesters um, at the, the Pope's recent visit. And you can see the various symbols and signals of rejection. Um, the pro-choice t-shirt, the 
yes, Baj, and so on, um, being worn by these people. Here as well is, is the, um, the kind of testimony of one of my informants. So after the 2011 census, when I entered myself as Catholic and subsequently realized that I just put this down because I felt I had to, as though honoring some strange sense of conscription, I don't want to be a number in their favor that can be employed in service of agendas they definitely disagree with. And I'm really not a Catholic. So this idea of kind of being pulled into awareness that through being Catholic, you support things that you really don't want to be supporting. But at the same time, what exists in opposition to this is this kind of cultural Catholic obstacle. So on the left here, we can see a kind of, kind of image that just depicts how, how, how integral Catholic ritual is to everyday Irish social life. So, and here is, is the testimony of one of the, the informants I have. So she's saying, yesterday my sister baptized her second child. I'm disgusted. I'm sure it was the first time she's been in a church since the baptism of her first child, before that her wedding. Maybe because she's not sure about what to believe. Maybe she wants to be able to get the kids into a school more easily. The reason is definitely not because she believes, although she would argue that it is to defend her actions. So I call this the eth ethic of authenticity. So it, it's, it's a kind of an ethic that emphasizes authentic belief and it derogates action that's not motivated by this factor. So according to people who, who feel this way morally, secular progress towards a, a society where church and state are separated takes precedence over local pragmatism. And for them, cultural Catholicism can often kind of seem like a kind of unwoken unbelief in, in Catholic religious dogma. It seems like a kind of complicity with a nefarious institution, often motivated by ease. So you see this also kind of manifesting in, um, in messaging around the census, for example. So here, for example, was a post in a, a, a website linked to a campaign to get people to disaffiliate from Catholicism um, in the recent census in 2016. So dear people of Ireland, what exactly will it take for you to dissociate yourselves from this disgusting organization which hides dead be babies, pedophiles, and then doesn't pay in, uh, the redress for survivors? Um, and then you see, so, so here you see the church itself kind of morally contaminated. It's a source of abuse, unfairness, authoritarianism, hypocrisy, and also disgust that were that kind of urge to withdraw to withdraw from the contaminated object. And then it moves on kind of in the next stage to, to the cultural Catholic themselves about the kind of inauthenticity of cultural Catholicism. You sell yourselves and your identity for a church wedding. You fake baptize your children for a school place and have a communion or a confirmation for a kiss. You know, you can, you can read the rest of it yourself there. And then the idea that basically a republic can never be free, that secular progress is impeded by this kind of infernal alliance between a sort of feckless cultural Catholic seeking ease and a kind of deeply entrenched nefarious church with an awful history of abuses behind it. So this also leads to the question, what about cultural Catholics themselves? I mean, are, are they believers? To a great degree, no, I don't think they are. Um, here is some testimony from a guy who put himself down as a Catholic on the census. So this is what he, what he, what he believes. I'd like to think there's some sort of release of this energy or electricity from a dead corpse into the oblivion or the universe or whatever. And then maybe we're just re-entered like a data bank or thrown back into the star making machine that turns out all these stars in the center of the galaxy 
but it's unfortunate to believe we're just food for crows. That's the way it is. So it's kind of a poetic, fluid speculation on the nature of existence. Then he talks about why he baptized his children. He had to. I had to baptize them because there would have been a holy war, a jihad, not by the Catholic priests, but the woman I was married to. There's no arguing with these people. It's a tradition that's expected and has to be respected. You have no argument against that. So juxtaposed against that ethic of authenticity in the previous slides, this is kind of an ethic of harmony. So it sort of separates off personal metaphysical beliefs that are private matters and takes them apart from social identity. And it kind of advocates for a sort of stoic agnosticism. So belief or unbelief, they're, they're unfixed, they're flexible, they're private. And atheism, where you get it, is a dark personal insight that other people aren't necessarily really capable of. And an important component in this is that it shouldn't be allowed to interfere with local obligations and bonds. And it's likely more prevalent, at least in my fieldwork, where these kind of bonds are strong and are important. Like I found this attitude more common among um, working class people I interviewed than the kind of middle class people who, who tended to have a cultural Catholicism that was more based on kind of educational pragmatism and wanting to get people into, into good schools and that kind of stuff. And just to say, this, this kind of ethos is completely compatible with a low estimation of the church and with support for secular moral objectives like, like the liberalization of, of, of abortion laws. But there's just a differing prioritization going on there. It's not that one is obliged to speak one's mind. It's one that has to be careful what you say for fear of doing damage to the links and social connections that surround you. So just to kind of wrap up, um, a lot of the field work I did was in those really, really kind of um, highly charged years of 2016, 17 and 18. Um, things have changed greatly since then. And what are the implications of that change? Well, on the one hand, I, as, I, as I hope I've demonstrated, institutionalized Catholicism is really a crucial component in generating the strongly anti-religious normative stance that data sets suggest the non-religious have here in Ireland. Um, but if we look at, at developments since 2018, um, there's been legislation um, prohibiting abortion and blasphemy removed by referenda. Divorce laws were liberalized by 80, 87% of the electorate. Um, there's been kind of significant mo movements towards reform of, of, of the education system. Uh, a bit limited, I think we'll all agree. And I kind of wonder what are the implications of these leaps towards institutional secularization for the tone of not being religious in Ireland. I mean, on the one hand, if something's no longer a threat, why fight it anymore? A lot of people have found um, who study European secularization that there's a tendency not for, for, for societies to go fully secular, but to sort of settle at a kind of local minimum of kind of low cost cultural religion, Danish Lutheranism being an example. So it could be that rather than Ireland going fully secular and repudiating the Catholic Church, now that it no longer appears to be the threat that it was, we could see a kind of resurgence of cultural Catholicism, maybe like a kind of low cost, easy, uh, sure, isn't baptism and, and communion and, and confession, isn't it just a bit of fun? What's the harm in it? could see a kind of resurgence of that. But of course, that keeps underneath the surface this ongoing level of connection between Irish and Catholic. And who knows how that might reemerge then in the future. So, I mean, we see now a future pregnant with various kind of threats. And as we know, religion thrives at its best when it's binding people together in response to, to threats to their existential welfare. 
So how might future threats alter the kind of relative appeal of, of this kind of cultural Catholicism and ex-Catholicism? And I mean, just to name a few, threat activates, activates in-group identities, such as religious identities. And it's worth wondering, like, what might Brexit mean for Irish cultural Catholicism, particularly if, if there's some sort of breakdown over, over, over uh, the kind of collapse of the UK and issues to do with the reunification of Ireland. You, you could see a resurgence of Catholicism, not as a religion, but as a kind of ethnic marker, um, especially if it leads to trouble. And COVID, I mean, COVID, the fear of death is stalking the land again. And there is no, no greater sucker to religious belief than the need to control what you can't control. And if the future is uncertain, if the future is haunted more by division and by fear and death. Whereas now it looks like Ireland is liberalizing and secularizing without question. I, I, I wouldn't write off the possibility that there could be a reversal at some point in the future. Um, so yeah, just to conclude, um, there are different Irish non-believing stances out there, loads of them, uh, if I was to crudely summarize, I'd say the kind of ex-Catholicism with its ethic of authenticity and the sort of privatized cultural Catholic, Catholic Gnosticism with its ethic of harmony, if not speaking that doubt. And I would say they're as much in tension with one another as they are with more devout stances. Um, still at the moment, ex-Catholicism is growing rapidly. I think it's noteworthy within Europe for its stance of moral disapproval of institutional and also cultural religion, which I think makes it somewhat different to other ways of being strongly anti-religious that you'll find in the United States, for example. Um, I, I would say its growth and appeal relate to a long-standing decline in creds, its institutional influence supported by cultural Catholicism, uh, kind of opposition to conservatism, and kind of the endemic issue of unresolved religious abuse scandals that contaminate the Catholic brand in this country. Um, however, though, institutional influence is diminishing rapidly, and I would keep your eye on the space because I think that could have potential implications for, excuse me, for the nature of what it means to be non-religious in Ireland in the future.